one of the things that disturbs me about political correctness, among many things that disturb me about pl political correctness, is its is its grounding in postmodern thought. And the postmodernists don't believe in rationality or debate. They think that's actually part of what they're fighting against. That's part of logocentrism, the idea that there you can bridge the gap between two people with with conversation. They just believe that's a a strategy on a ploy on the part of the people who have power to maintain their power and to justify it by engaging in the pretense of negotiation and and it's it's part and parcel of their philosophy and yes increasingly we're teaching our students that because the postmodernists have invaded they certainly invaded the education system i mean and, and not just the universities also increasingly through the faculties of education in our culture, we always have discussions about rights. My rights are being trampled on. My rights are being trampled on. Well, of course they're being trampled on. Everyone's rights get trampled on, and some more than others, obviously. But there isn't a dialogue about responsibility. That's what the dialogue should be about. It's like, yeah, you're oppressed, but you're not as oppressed as a bunch of other people. So are you the oppressor or are you the oppressed? Which one? You see these Ivy League students who are agitating on behalf of the oppressor, uh, of the oppressed. It's like they're irritated because being in the top one in 1,000 people in the world isn't enough. There's somebody who is better off, who's one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. They point to them and say, well, you're the oppressor because you know, you're know you 1% you're of the 1% and I'm just the 1%. But you know they forget about the starving masses in the rest of the world in relationship to whom, well, they're obviously oppressors. You're the, you're oppressed. Okay, fine. You're the oppressor too. You're the victim. Okay, fine. You're the goddamn perpetrator too. So maybe you should take some responsibility for that. And no, it's not that. We're not going to do that. Someone else is going to be the perpetrator. That's convenient. If it's always someone else, then all the good is on your side. And all the evil is on their side. And once you put all the evil on someone's side, then the next thing to do is to take whatever action against them you see fit. And why not? Because that's where all the evil resides. That just makes you good. What are you going to do? Put up with it? So, and that's, we're busily teaching our young people that as fast as we possibly can. So, and I think it's, 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 it's motivated in part by this postmodern cancer that, whose goal is to gnaw on the roots, gnaw on the roots, gnaw on the roots until the whole corrupt, oppressive, patriarchal system. So that's the tyrannical king, right? That's the mythological projection of the tyrannical king who eats his own children. That's, that's the mythological idea behind the patriarchy. We'll gnaw on that till it falls over. Well, and then what? Well, then, I don't know what, what? The equity utopia will magically arrive. God. contributors to poverty are well it's not so good to have a low IQ you know people don't like the idea of IQ because it seems so arbitrary you know you have a high IQ well it's not like you deserve it exactly it's you're set up that way pretty much right from the beginning it's very 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 stable you can make a high IQ person stupider by you know not educating them up to the level of their possibility but Taking someone who has a low IQ and trying to raise that, it's like, if you can figure out how to do that, well, you know, it's Nobel Prize time for you, because people have tried that a lot, and most recently with those, you know, Lumosity games and that sort of thing, and the evidence that those produce anything other than brilliant performances on the Lumosity game itself is basically zero. We haven't been able to figure out how to... See, because intelligence is a cross-domain phenomena and you can get really good in a single domain by practicing like mad and what you'd want is to practice like mad in a single domain and hope that it generalized to other domains that's the holy grail of intelligence increase it's like, no no one's done it, people claim it but the claims never hold up and people have been trying for a long time to do it and they haven't been able to do it and Differences in IQ really make a difference, you know, I mean You guys average IQs probably 125, 130 
at, at 115, you're at the 85th percentile. And, and, and 115 would barely get you going for, for a, a hard university. 130, you're probably graduate school material. You know, 145, you're up there at the range where you can probably do pretty much whatever you want. Although, as you get smarter, the scatter between your abilities increases. So you might have a very high verbal IQ, but not be so good at mathematics or the other way around. But it's a massive contributor to lifetime success. And I don't know what to do about that. I mean, why do smart people make more money? Well, they get to where the edge of production is faster. So if you have a thousand people and you rank order them by IQ, the smart people are going to come up with the new ideas first. And they're going to have more ideas. And they're going to strategize better. And, you know, with an IQ of 90, which is 15% of the population, you think about that, it's 15% of the population. That's pretty much the threshold for reading instructions and being able to follow them. So, you know, and our society is increasingly sophisticated, so it's by no means obvious. You know, the liberals think, well, this society is unfair because there's unemployment, and the conservatives think, well, there's a job for everyone, and, but none of them think, well, there are massive, massive, massive differences in people's ability, far greater than anyone realizes, and that poses a structural problem. Yeah. So there's this interesting phenomena that, that's very characteristic of, of, of societies, I believe, pretty much everywhere it's being studied. Now, you can calculate an index called the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient is a, a number that represents how much inequality of income distribution there is in a given geographical area. So you could calculate a Gini coefficient for a street or, uh, you know, um, an area in a city, or a city, or a state, or a country. You can do it at all those levels. And uh, what you find is, you know, you, you always hear this idea that poverty causes crime. That's a classic left-wing idea. But it's wrong. It's seriously wrong. And it's importantly wrong. And it's de definitively wrong. Not only that. So there's no argument about this. It's already been established. What causes crime, especially aggressive crime, is relative poverty. And relative poverty is not the same thing as poverty at all. It's seriously not the same thing. Poverty is when you don't have enough to eat. Relative poverty is when the guy next door has a much better car than you. So, and there's lots of relative poverty in the United States, and there's some absolute poverty, but even the absolute poverty in the United States is nothing like the absolute poverty, say, in places like India or in sub-Saharan Africa, where absolute poverty means you have nothing. Now, what's really interesting about the Gini coefficient is that if you go to places where everyone, roughly speaking, is, is poor, say by national standards, um, I, I think South Dakota was often used as an example, or maybe one of the maritime provinces, um, like Newfoundland, where there's, where there's low average income, but it's pretty flat distribution. There's almost no crime. And if you go to places where the, everyone's rich, then there's almost no crime. But if you go places where there are poor people and moderately well-off people and rich people and the distribution is really steep, then the rate of aggressive behavior among young men, and it's usually within their own ethnic group, starts to sp skyrocket out of control. And the reason for that seems to be that if the dominance hierarchy is too steep, then the young men have no likelihood of climbing to a dominant position while playing the standard social game. And so what they do is turn to aggression, aggression to, to make their mark on the world. And it works too. That's the other thing, is that make no mistake about it. If you're, if you're looking for status in a place where status is hard to achieve, and you're the meanest, toughest guy around, then, and you know, around a bunch of people who, like you, don't have much money, then you're going to benefit from that status. It, it, it works. Yeah? Would that be um would that be uh, part of the reason why because I know the I think that the violent crime rate in the US is higher than it is in Canada. Would that be part of the reason why sure. Or, okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean you can make a real conservative argument for making sure that you know the conservatives are very anti income distribution and, and we figure that's because of the guys that have this male independence, 
you know, they identify with this male independence factor. They don't want to be distributing resources to people who are down the dominance hierarchy because they won't, they want them down in the dominance hierarchy. They want there to be a difference between the people on top and the people on the bottom so that they can be the people on top so that it increases their relative attractiveness. Like it's a perfectly logical game. And they presume that, well, the rules are set up and like every man can go for it, do his best, and the winner wins and the loser loses, and that's just how it is. And don't ask me to fix it because I, I don't want to, you know. And it, besides that, it's, I don't find it, I find it distasteful to attempt to fix it more than that, right? Because it's a moral issue. It's not just a, an intellectual issue. So, so you, you can make a case, however, you can make a case from the conservative point of view, especially with regards to, say, beliefs in religious traditionalism and the desire to maintain social stability, that you shouldn't let income distribution become too unequal. Like, one of the big things your society has to do is to make sure that that doesn't get out of hand, because it tends to get out of hand. It tends towards a few people having everything and almost everyone else having nothing. It's a natural, in, in a sense, it's a natural consequence of economic progression, which is actually something that Marx pointed out, although an Italian named Perito had figured it out at approximately the same time, and I think with a lot more conceptual clarity. But the more unequal you let your society get, the higher the probability of, of death, roughly speaking, through, through violent causes. And, you know, um, but, but, but I'm telling you why it is, is that you know, men want to climb the dominance hierarchy, and the reason they want to climb the dominance hierarchy is because that's how they get access to women. I was going to uh, actually ask earlier in, in this discussion when you were talking about um, the familiar and the unfamiliar and the structure. Um, so it seems like we all want to live within the structure, but we don't want the rules to apply to ourselves. Well, we, we have this contradictory problem. We want to be protected by the structure, but we want to advance our position within it. And so that means what that should mean, and this is, I, I think, the definition of civilized behavior, is that you're allowed to advance your position within the structure as long as you don't disrupt it negatively. You know, and I think most people do do that. In fact, I think people in, in civilized countries do that so effectively that it's an absolute incomprehensible miracle. I can't understand how or why it ever got established. But like a psychopath will climb the ladder and cut the rungs off underneath them, fundamentally, right? It's like he doesn't care. He doesn't even care if the damn thing maintains itself. You know, he's perfectly willing to have it destroyed after he's exhausted it. You know, but if everyone acted like that, or even if a, a fairly substantial percentage of people acted like that, the whole thing would come to a halt virtually, like, in, in no time, flat. So, so, I mean, why... See, you might... Here, here's a reason, likely. You know, because one of the things we were talking about was masculine violence. Now, the thing about masculine violence is it only tends to emerge in situations where there, doesn't, there don't seem to be any other reasonably viable means of advancing status. So it's not reasonable to say that men are aggressive. You can say that on average men are more aggressive than women. And you can also say that if, that if you put men in a situation where they have no... where they can see status differences but they have no means of moving forward, that they're likely to turn to aggression as a way of establishing dominance. And then you can say that that's, the reason for that is because it makes them more attractive. Well, the fundamental reason, yeah? Um, yeah, just like to add on, um, I read this article once that talked about how polygamous uh, societies are more violent than women. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the same reason, because like, when, when one guy has two wives. I mean, 50% of the population have no... That's right. No access to sex. Yeah, that's exactly right. That the, 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 the evolutionary psychology explanation for the pathology of polygamy is that if once you let it establish itself, then the men get ultra-violent. So, so would you say that, like, monogamy would almost be, like, the basis for, like, society? Many people have said that. And, yes, I think you can make a strong case for that. And I think the fundamental reason is the one that you just pointed out. You know, the idea is... Well, would you rather have one woman or die? You know, or, sorry, that's not quite right. Would you rather, no, that's not quite, that's not quite right. Would you, it's more like, would you be willing to limit yourself to one partner or have a shot at many partners but a much higher probability of dying? Yeah. Right. 
And, you know, some guys will take that. They'll take the, the high-risk approach, you know. So now, it, this doesn't eliminate the difference in individual differences in determining who's going to be aggressive, because what will happen is that as the Gini coefficient pressure rises, the more aggressive men, the men who are more aggressive by nature, will get more aggressive first, right? So you can imagine that it's a threshold phenomenon in some sense. So, and what I should tell you as well is the relationship between the Gini coefficient and male-on-male -male homicide isn't like 0.2 or 0.3, which is about the, the correlation that you'd get if you were predicting something like that using personality. It's like 0.8 or 0.9. It's like it eats up all of it. It's the explanation. So it's a huge effect. You know, it's so, it's so big an effect that you could basically say, oh, well, we figured that out, although psychologists never know when they figured anything out and they keep endlessly retesting it over and over and over because, you know, we don't know how to bring our science to a stop. But if you don't accept the Gini coefficient aggression data, it's like you might as well throw the rest of social sciences out the window because the, the effect is unbelievably powerful. Uh, what geographical area does this take place in? It dep you can do it at any level of analysis. You can, do it, you can do it by county, you can do it by city, you can do it by state, and you can do it by country. And it works on all of those levels. Like it predicts aggression? Model? You bet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. I mean, the methodologically sophisticated studies have done exactly that to ensure that, well, to ensure that it's actually this phenomena rather than other factors that might be operative in that particular geographical area. So countries with a higher Gini coefficient are more violent. And cities within that country that have a higher than average Gini coefficient for that country are more violent on average. It's a very, very robust, robust, robust finding. What kind of relationship do you have with your father? Your real father? It's often ambivalent, right? Because there was an element of him that encouraged you, hopefully, because without the encouragement of your father, man, the world is a dismal place. It's very difficult to be a courageous person, unless you have your father in, in body and spirit behind you. It's very de demoralizing. Like, it really kills people not to have their mother. They just don't recover from that. But, and, and I think people can recover from a fragmented father relationship, but it's the next worst thing. You know, because if your father rejects you or doesn't form a relationship with you, it's as if the spirit of civilization has left you outside the walls as of little worth. It's very difficult for people to recover from that. So the father should be an encouraging force, but can be a tyrannical and crushing force. And so that's, very, that's a very difficult thing to get right, partly because if you're my son, then I should impose the highest standards of behavior on you. And I should always be judging what you're doing. I should be judging it with, with the aim of making the best in you come forward. But, but getting that balance exactly right is very difficult. And so it's easy to, for a father to swing too much into judgment, let's say. And then, of course mothers can play this role too. To swing too far into the domain of judgment and to be too harsh. And to the degree that the father has his own pathologies, he's going to do that imperfectly. You know, he might be someone who's who's uh, the father who devours his son because he's jealous of the new possibility, the new potential, the, the struggle for, for uh, attention and love from the mother or from the other children in the family. There's all sorts of things that can go terribly wrong. So that's the father as wise king. And that's another symbol that's been lost, I would say, to a massive degree in modern universities because all we're taught is to tear that down. And, and to not even notice that it manifests itself everywhere, especially in the universities, which are like they're as close to an ideal environment as you could, as human beings have ever been able to create. It's as simple as that. And if you can't be grateful for, for the structure of the university with all its imperfections, then, then you're completely blind to this element of the archetype. And that's the opposite of it. That's the son that devours, the king that devours his own son. That's a tyrant. You know, that's like the mother who's too overprotective. It's the male version of that. And the mother that's too overprotective says, I'll never let anything happen to you. 
It's like, well, maybe you actually want to have something happen to you. You know, it's a bit of an all-inclusive statement. It's like, no, I'm going to make you strong so any number of things can happen to you. And when, you're, when you need some care, I'll be there. But otherwise, like out into the world with you, that's the right attitude. And for the father, it's like, get your bloody act together. But I'm on your side. It's because, not because I want to destroy you or demean you or push you down in the dominance hierarchy, but because I want the best in you to emerge. And so you need standards. It's like, what are you doing wasting your life? There's way more than that to you. Get your act together and, and bring it out. And that's a message that people really want to hear if they have any sense at all. And generally they do want to hear it. So, you know, I was talking, I've been talking to a lot of people recently, as, as per perhaps you know. And I was talking to one of the leaders of the conservatives this morning. And they're, they're asking me about, the person was asking me about Bill C-16, but more specifically about talking to young people, because the conservative leadership struggle is going on right now. I've been talking to a bunch of them, and I said, well, look, one of the things you could do for young people that no one's doing is to talk to them about responsibility. Because you know, everyone talks to young people about rights. It's like, we need our rights. It's like, oh, God. How many rights do you need? You know, really, like you have more privileges than any people who've ever lived anywhere. Well, it's so dull to hear. It's so dull. It's so pathetic. And, and uh, what would you call it? It's so demeaning that you have to be protected and have your rights. It's like I said, there's a huge marketplace for responsibility. That's what you want to talk to young people about. It's like, get your act together and do something worthwhile with your life. For the first time in my entire adult life, the conservatives actually have something to sell young people, right? They can sell them responsibility. It's like, well, why? Because that's where me life has meaning with responsibility. The more responsibility you take on, the more meaning your life has. And the, the higher degree of responsibility that you agree voluntarily to try to bear, the richer your life will be. And no one's ever told that, and it's the case. You know, it's like you have, you have four kids, say. Well, that's plenty of responsibility. You're going to have meaning. It's going to be rough, you know, because it's complicated. You have a complicated job, and you try to help the careers of the people around you. You try to solve tough problems and aid suffering and do all of that. It's like, it's weight. It's responsibility, but it's, there's glory in it. There's real glory in it. There's deep meaning in it. And... and and young people are starving for that because no one ever tells them that. It's like, you're way more than you think. Man, stand up. Do something difficult. Do something difficult and heroic, right? Burst out of your bonds. It's like, that's a good message. It's a necessary message because we have to be more than we are because if we, if we aren't, we're not going to survive. That's why a dragon hoards gold. It's like, what's up with that? Well, it'll eat you, and it will, but it has gold. Well, so what do you do about that? Because it's, it's, it's paradoxical demands. Well, what you want to do is face the dragon and get the damn gold. That's what you want to do. Well, you have to be a paradoxical being even to do that. So, you know, in, in The Hobbit, for example, when, what's his name? Frodo, right? Isn't, it's not, or it's Bilbo. It's Bilbo in The Hobbit. You know, he's kind of this little underdeveloped, overprotected shire dweller. And he's called on a great adventure to go and find the dragon. And he has to become a thief in order to manage it. Well, that's pretty weird. You know, it's like, well, it's, it's because as a good citizen, he's just not enough to conquer a dragon. He has to also become a bad citizen in some sense. He has to incorporate the part of himself that's monstrous, let's say, and develop that and hone it. And, and that's to say that, well, if you're harmless, you're not virtuous. You're just harmless. You're like a rabbit. A rabbit isn't virtuous. It's just, it just can't do anything except get eaten. It's not virtuous. If you're a monster and you don't act monstrously, then you're virtuous. But you also have to be a monster. Well, you see this all the time. Harry Potter's like that, too. It's like he's, he's flawed, he's hurt, he's got evil in him. He can talk to snakes, man. He breaks rules all the time. All the time. He's not at obedient at all. But, you know, he has a good reason for breaking the rules. And, it, and if he couldn't break the rules, him and his little clique of rule-breaking 
you know, troublemakers, if they didn't break the rules, they wouldn't attain the highest goal. So it's very peculiar, but it's, it's very, very, it's a very, 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 very common mythological notion. You know, the hero has to be, the hero has to be a monster, but a controlled monster. Batman is like that, you know, I mean, it's, it's everywhere, it's, it's, it's the story you always hear. Is there a moral from ethics? Meaning, you have to be more precise. I feel like, because everyone's moral, but in order to, from ethics, you have to define the moral. Well, that, that's, a good, that's a good question, you know, because one question is, you know, you're kind of implicitly moral insofar as you're socialized But that's sort of procedural, it's just built into you This is different, this is also becoming conscious of it And expanding out your personality into dimensions that it wouldn't normally occupy So, this happens to people all the time So, for example, lots of my clients, my clinical clients, are too agreeable and. Um, they're generally women, because women are more agreeable than men But not always, because I've had agreeable men as clients as well And what happens is, they, they're resentful and, and they don't know how to stand up for themselves And it's because they're very compassionate by nature And so, if you're entering into a negotiation with them, they'll let you win Well, that's not so good, because you know, you need to win too Especially if you're in an organization of adults Where there's, there's a struggle, right? With, when you have kids, you can let them win Especially infants, You're like you have to let them win, and that's partly why compassion is so necessary. But as a as a basis for negotiation between adults, it's like, sorry, it's it's insufficient. You have to you have to be a bit of a monster so that you can say no. And so a lot of what you do in in psychotherapy is treat people's anxiety and depression. That's a huge chunk of it. Help them straighten out the way they think. That's a huge chunk of it. But another chunk of it is. Well, let's toughen you up, you know, let's put you in a position where you can bargain Let's teach you how to assert yourself and stand up for yourself And that's assertiveness training, and it's a huge chunk of psychotherapy And you need to, you need to learn it, it's like, because Part of how you regulate your interactions with other people is to negotiate And you cannot negotiate unless you can say no You can't do it and it causes conflict to say no, and if you don't like conflict, which is basically the definition of being agreeable Then you can't tolerate the conflict, and so then you can't negotiate on your own behalf And so then you keep losing, and you're bullied, and you know, it's, it's not good Then you get resentful, and, and it's really not good So you have to develop your inner monster a little bit and, and then that makes you a better person, not a worse person It's weird, it's weird, but but that's just how it is You don't want a factual description of every muscle twitch You want them to distill their experiences down into the gist Which is the significance of the experience And the significance of the experience is roughly What you can derive from listening to the experience That will change the way that you look at the world And act in the world so it's valuable information, and they can tell you a terrible story, and that can be valuable because that can tell you how not to look in the world Look at the world and act in it, or they can tell you a positive story, you can derive benefit either way Which is why we also like to go watch stories about horrible psychopathic thugs um, You know, and, and hopefully we're learning not to be like them, although there are additional advantages in that You know Someone who, you might be some, say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect Because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is And so, part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them Which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect Because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, Or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous And then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect And other people do the same thing and so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel Is better than not being able to be cruel 
because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous, but you have it under control. And, you know, a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. But if you happen to have to get in one, and, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. And so the strength that you develop in your monstrousness is actually the best guarantee of peace. And that's partly why Jung believed that it was necessary for people to integrate their shadow. And he said that was a terrible thing for people to attempt because the human shadow, <clears throat> which is all those things about yourself that you don't want to realize, reaches all the way to hell. And what he meant by that was it's through an analysis of your own shadow that you can come to understand why other people are capable, and you as well, of the sorts of terrible atrocities that characterized, let's say, the 20th century. And without that understanding, there's no possibility of bringing it under control. When you study Nazi Germany, for example, or you study the Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin, and you're asking yourself, well, what are these perpetrators like? Forget about the victims, let's talk about the perpetrators. The answer is, they're just like you. And if you don't know that, that just means that you don't know anything about people, including yourself. And then it also means that you have to discover why they're just like you. And believe me, that's no picnic. So that's enough to traumatize people, and that's partly why they don't do it. And it's also partly why the path to enlightenment and wisdom is seldom trod upon. Because if it was all a matter of following your bliss and doing what made you happy, then everyone in the world would be a paragon of wisdom. But it's not that at all. It's, the, it's a matter of facing the thing you least want to face. And everyone has that old... There's this old story in King Arthur where the knights go off to look for the Holy Grail which is either the cup that Christ drank out of at the Last Supper or the cup into which the blood that gushed from his side was poured when he was crucified. The stories vary, but it's, it's basically a, a holy object, like the phoenix in some sense, that's representation, a representation of transformation. So it's, a, it's an ideal, and so King Arthur's knights, who sit at a round table because they're all roughly equal, go off to find the most valuable thing. And, they, and where do you look for the most valuable thing when you don't know where it is? Well, each of the knights looks at the forest surrounding the castle and enters the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And that's a good thing to understand because the gateway to wisdom and the gateway to the development of personality, which is exactly the same thing, is precisely through the portal, portal that you do not want to climb through. And the reason for that is actually quite technical. This is a Jungian presupposition too, is that, well, there's a bunch of things about you that are underdeveloped, and a lot of those things are because there's things you've avoided looking at because you don't want to look at them, and there's parts of you you've avoided developing because it's hard for you to develop those parts. And so it's, it's by virtual necessity that what you need is where you don't want to look because that's where you've kept it. And so, and that's why there's, you know, an idiosyncratic element of it for everyone. Your particular place of enlightenment and terror is not going to be the same as yours, except that they're both places of enlightenment and terror. So they're equivalent at one level of analysis and, and different at another. So anyways, back to fiction and, 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 and what it does. It, it distills truth and it, pr it, it produces characters that are composites. And the more they become composites, the more they approximate a mythological character. And so they become more and more universally true and more and more approximating religious deities. But the problem with that is they become more and more distant from individual experience. And so... With literature, there's this very tight line where you need to make the character more than merely human, but not so much of a god that 
You know, one of the things that happened to Superman in the 1980s, Superman started out, he's got a heavenly set of parents, but by the way, and an earthly set of parents, and he's an orphan like Harry Potter, very common theme, is that when Superman first emerged, he could only jump over buildings, you know, and maybe he could stop a locomotive, but by the time the 1980s rolled around, like he could juggle planets and, you know, swallow hydrogen bombs and, you know, he could do anything. Well, people stopped buying the Superman comics because how interesting is that? It's like something horrible happens and Superman deals with it. And, and something else horrible happens and Superman deals with it. And it's like, that's dull. He turned into such an archetype. He was basically the omniscient, omnipresent, um, Om omnipotent God, and that's no fun. It's like God wins, and then God wins again, and then again God wins, and you know. So then they had to weaken him in different ways with kryptonite, you know. So green kryptonite kind of made him sick, and red kryptonite, I think, kind of mutated him, if I remember correctly. And anyways, they had to introduce flaws into his character so that there could be some damn plot. And that's something to think about, you know. There's a deep existential lesson in that, in that your being is limited and, and flawed and, and fragile. Um, you're like the genie, which is genius in the little tiny, in the little tiny uh, lamp, you know, this immense potential, but constrained in this tiny little living space, as Robin Williams said when he played the genie in Aladdin. But the fact that you have limitations means that the plot of your life is the overcoming of those limitations, and that if you didn't have limitations, well, there wouldn't be a plot, and maybe there would be no life. And so that's part of the reason why perhaps you have to accept the fact that you're flawed and insufficient and, and live with it and consider it a precondition for being. It's at least a reasonable, it's a reasonable idea. So anyways, one of the main characters is the country, the known, the explored territory. We went over that a bit. And it always has two elements. I mean, your country is your greatest friend and your worst enemy, you know, because it squashes you into conformity and demands that you act in a certain manner and reduces your individuality to that element that's tolerated by everyone else. And it, it constrains your potential in a single direction. And so it's really tyrannical, but at the same time, it provides you with a place to be and all of the benefits that have accrued as a result of the actions of your ancestors and all the other people that you're associated with. So there's the good tyrant or the bad tyrant and the good king and those are archetypal figures and that's because they're always true and they're always true simultaneously. You know, which is partly why I object to the notion of the patriarchy because it's a myth law. It's the, it's the what do you call that? It's the apprehension of a mythological trope, which is that of the evil tyrant, without any appreciation for the fact that the archetype actually has two parts, and the other part is the wise king. And, you know, you can tell an evil tyrant story about culture, no problem, but it's one-sided, and, and that's very dangerous, because you don't want to forget all the good things that you have while you're criticizing all the ways that things are in error. That's a lack of gratitude, and it's a lack of wisdom, and it's, it's founded in resentment, and it's, it's very dangerous, uh, both personally and socially. We certainly choose each other for self-awareness and consciousness and intelligence. And I don't, you know, if you're, if you're choosing a mate, there's an arms race in human beings. We're choosing intelligent mates, especially, that's especially the case for women in relationship to men. So... Um, so that the idea that that's a choice, well, that's partly why it's Eve that makes Adam self-conscious in the Garden of Eden, right? She offers him the apple. She's the one that makes him self-conscious. And I think that's actually accurate, because the evidence from the evolutionary biologists is that human sexual, female sexual selection was one of the driving factors that differentiated us from chimpanzees. It's a major factor. Chimpanzee females are not selective maters. They go into estrus, they'll mate with anything. What happens is the dominant males chase the subordinate males away, and so they end up leaving more offspring. But it's not a consequence of selection on the part of the females. In human beings, it's completely different. Concealed ovulation and intense selection pressure from women on men. You have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. 
And people can never have a, have a hard time working that out arithmetically, but it's not that problematic. You just think, on average, every woman had one child. Half of men had none, and the other half had two. And that's approximately correct if you average across the entire history of human sexuality. So human males in particular are subject to vicious selection pressure on the part of females, and I also think that's partly why nature is represented symbolically as female among human beings, because after all, nature is what selects. There's no better definition of nature than that which selects. There's another way of representing it. The dragon of chaos stands for the potential that surrounds us. Inside of that, there's the unknown, the unknown that you actually come into contact with, right? That's the unknown as it actually manifests itself in your world as something you don't understand, instead of just the potential for that. Because we say, look, you know perfectly well that as you're sitting here, there's all sorts of things you don't know everywhere. But where are they? Well, they're not manifesting themselves at the moment, they're only in potential. But you could, we could have a discussion that, that became argumentative, and then all of a sudden, it would be as if emissaries of that unknown had entered the space. And that's the unknown that's defined in relationship to what you know. That's what you actually experience, instead of it only being potential. It's a tough thing to get, because they're both unknown, right? You think, well, how can there be two different categories of unknown? Well, latent and manifest, that's a good way of thinking about it. You know, you, in a relationship, it's going stably, but you know that sooner or later something will come up. Okay, up. From where? Why up? Well, from, from beneath. Well, what do you mean beneath? Well, it's from, it's from your complex, the person you're in a relationship with, in, in with, is complicated and complex. That's implicit in you. It's, it's inside your conceptual structure. That's, that's a way of looking at it. Now and then, when there's a disagreement, it will manifest itself, and you know that. You know that there's still trouble brewing ahead in a relationship, always. And that's part of what keeps them alive. There's an interesting piece of empirical work done on this a while back. So you might think, well, what does the optimal relationship look like in terms of positive and negative emotion? You might say, well, utopia, nothing but positive interactions. It's like, no. Imagine you get people to code the interactions they have with their partner during the day. You know, you sample it. You say, was that interaction positive or negative? And then what you're trying to do is predict the longevity of the relationship. Okay, so here's the data. If it falls under five positive interactions to one negative interaction, the relationship doesn't continue. Fair enough, too much negative. That's easy to understand. If it exceeds 11 positive to one negative, the relationship doesn't last. Why? No challenge. Right? What do you want from your partner? Bliss? No. No, no, you don't. You want periods of peace punctuated by a good fight. And that because that means you respect them, means you have something to offer each other, and it means that you're both growing. And so you don't want the fight to be too dramatic, because, well, then you retreat, you can't settle it. But the person that you can completely map and who only does positive things for you, it's like, A, you don't know that person. B, they're not communicating with you, nor you with them. Maybe they're just subordinating themselves to you or you to them. And you're not growing. You want someone who can... A real relationship is a wrestling match, it's a grappling, it's a grappling phenomena that you both emerge transformed from, and that's what people want. They don't want a pushover, not, not unless there's something wrong with them. You know, a narcissistic person who never wants to be challenged will want a partner who does nothing but deliver exactly what they're told to deliver, but they will mistreat them beyond belief, and perhaps deservedly so. So what does it mean for this symbol to emerge from the feminine symbol, let's say, to emerge from chaos? Well, this picture, this is a picture of Venus, the goddess of love, right? And so I cut this picture out of a larger picture, and it's Venus manifesting herself in a transcendent space in the sky, in the same way that Christ did in the previous representation. And she has rays coming off her, and there's all these men who are knights kneeling in front of the image. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that men use the image of female perfection to motivate themselves. And that's exactly right. That's precisely what they do. You see that in the Tom Sawyer story. So Tom Sawyer is about 12 years old, and he's still hanging around with his friends, like Huck Finn. And this girl moves across the street, Becky, and she comes out, and he's struck by her for the first time in his life. Something's changed. 
and the first thing he does is hop up on a picket fence and show off and balance in front of her and he's saying, well look at me, look at me I'm, he's like the male bower bird building something beautiful so the female will approve of it and it's, it's motivation you know, and that's something that I think modern women don't really understand about men they don't understand that at least to the degree that males are uncorrupted and, and not better because of being rejected they're doing everything they can to kneel before the eternal image of the feminine and try to make themselves worthy that's the chivalry story, right? that's what you should encourage in your partner so, and so out of chaos emerges this first form, it's the feminine form it's partly the form that represents novelty as such so, and, and on one hand it's promise, on the other hand it's threat that you wouldn't believe, and I don't know, because I don't know I, I don't understand the situation with women as well as I understand the situation with men obviously, being a man but I, <coughs> I don't know if women have any idea how paralyzing they are to especially young men <coughs> a lar very large number of my clinical clients, but also young men I've talked to in general are absolutely terrified of women, because they're terrified of being rejected and the terror exists in precise proportion to the retraction to the woman which is a horrible paradoxical situation to be in, it's often why men make such fools of themselves in front of women that they're attracted to, it's because first of all they don't see the woman that they're attracted to because what the hell do they know about her, they don't see her as an individual they see her as the manifestation of a judgmental ideal and then it's only in establishing the relationship with the actual woman that they can start differentiating between the judgmental ideal and, and the actual individual woman and that also requires a sacrifice and the sacrifice is you never can have an ideal woman so to have a relationship with any woman you have to sacrifice the relationship with the ideal woman and you have to see the individual woman and separate her from the ideal and that's the same thing that happens to the hero in Sleeping Beauty, right? he sees the evil queen who actually turns into the dragon of chaos and it's not until he can, he can defeat her that he can establish a relationship with the actual princess and that's exactly the case I had a, one of my clients who ran this men's group which was quite interesting one of the things they had the initiates do, which was very intelligent, was to go out and ask 50 women in one day for their phone numbers why? politely, properly, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it was a game, but it wasn't a stupid game and the idea was, get over your fear of rejection and how do you do that? by encountering it continually and continually and continually so that you're no longer paralyzed by this because postmodernism manages as a response, it's a response to the Nietzschean dilemma, right? the cornerstone of civilization has been demolished by rational critique and no wonder, it needed to be criticized, but it needed to be more deeply understood and criticism and deep understanding are the same thing unless the criticism is only destruction because if you criticize something, what you're doing is separating the wheat from the chaff you're not burning all of it, you're saying, well, not this, not this, but definitely this, definitely this and that's what education should provide you with the opportunity to do as well what should we conserve and what should we dispense with? well, we conserve what's centrally true and now we need to understand it we have to conserve the idea that the individual has an infinite responsibility to the direction of being and we know that, you know perfectly well that you live in a relationship with your own conscience and when you violate the moral order that's part and parcel of your soul you're ashamed and hide and bitter and then you get angry you can't show your face to other people you can't even look at yourself in the mirror and you know perfectly well that's true even though you may not know what to do about it or how to get out of it it's, there's a moral order built into human beings if there wasn't, there's no way we could even communicate with one another because there'd be no rules of communication there'd be nothing that we mutually wanted or expected from each other you know, one of the things I figured out is that we're all appalled when we run into another person who is not yet the Redeemer every person you ever meet, you're, you're dissatisfied with because they're not who they could be and you're broadcasting that message at everyone all the time you're not who you could be, you're not who you could be, you're not who you could be I'm not who I could be and we're all facing each other with our emotional displays pleading with each other to become that which we could become 
and everyone knows it, but we won't do it, and it's no wonder. The postmodernists, they're the, they're the logical conclusion of the Nietzschean dilemma. God is dead. Value, the value structure collapsed. The specter arises of all value structures collapsing. That's the postmodernist dogma. All value structures have collapsed. They're only there for the purposes of exclusion. They have no intrinsic value. It's a very, very powerful argument. That's why it dominates the universities. That and the fact that it allows people to dispense with their moral responsibility, which is something that's never discussed by the postmodernists. But you have to give the devil his due. What's the problem with postmodernism? Well, if all value structures have collapsed, then there's nothing to do. Because in order to do something, one thing has to be better than another. Because otherwise, why do it? And so people who are ensconced in the postmodern tradition are undermined by their own philosophy. They can deconstruct their own deconstruction, in which case they might as well just sit there and do nothing, which would actually be preferable to what they're doing now. <laughs> so how do they extract themselves from that dilemma? They do it illogically, but they don't care. Because the postmodernists, first of all, don't believe in logic. That's a reflection of the logos, which they've dispensed with. Dialogue, they don't believe in, because that's a reflection of the logos, which they've dispensed with. Logic and dialogue are irrelevant. Well, that does bring up the problem of what to do. Well, the postmodernists finesse that by reverting to the Marxist doctrines from which postmodernism emerged. And so they say, well, yeah, you can't get any direction from postmodernism, but we don't we're not going to worry about that because we don't worry about such things. What we'll do is just use sleight of hand to push forward the communitarian doctrines out of which our original hypothesis emerged. And everyone says, well, we'll turn a blind eye to the paradox because we actually need something to do. And plus, to the degree that we're communitarian, we can take out our nihilistic resentment and arrogance and ingratitude on every single person we deem to have something more than we have. And so if you're wondering why certain values can exist in the absence of any value, you have to look no farther than to understand that people who are desperate and chaotic will still be angry and destructive. And they can manifest that perfectly with the moral mask that says, well, I'm not really after what you have because you have a little more than me. I'm speaking on behalf of these people who have even less. It's like, it's absolute nonsense. It's so funny watching Yale students complain about the privileged. They're in the top one-tenth of one-hundredth of a percent of people who've lived in, in the entire history of the planet, much less just the people that are on the planet now. They're dominating patriarchs in training, right? They're baby representatives of the patriarchy. And all they do is complain about that tiny, tiny, infinitesimal fraction of people who have slightly more than they have now. It's appalling. And their idiot professors pat them on the back and send them out the world to do that instead of teaching them how to live. They damage their mental health. They, they, they hurt our society. They're bringing things down. And that's what they're aiming at. The postmodernists manage to be nihilistic and totalitarian at the same time which is something that not even Nietzsche dreamed about, despite the fact that he had the greatest imagination for pathology that perhaps ever existed. In addition, they combine the nihilism and the totalitarianism with the worst aspects of dogmatic religion, because what they've essentially established is a cult into which children who attend university are now indoctrinated, at great cost, I might add, and with very little practical outcome. What's the alternative, given that they have a point? Well, as far as I can tell, the alternative is a proper return to the past. And that is precisely to journey into the chaos, to look at the worst possible thing, and to pull the dead father up from the chaotic depths. That's how you stop being a puppet. Someone whose strings are being pulled by forces they do not understand behind the scenes.
You find out what's great about your culture, this thing that's provided us with everything that we see in this room, this amazing warmth that we're experiencing when it's 30 bloody below outside, the fact that the electricity is on and that computational resources are working and that we can all sit here peacefully and that no one is hungry. In fact, we're too fat. That's our big problem. Oh no, <laughs> we have so much stuff we're getting fat. Yeah, well, that's a good problem to have. We should have some gratitude for what's been produced that's brought us to this point and we need to wake up and understand what we're doing. Well, that's what, that's what people like that's what the psychoanalysts were trying to do in the 20th century. That's what all the great clinicians were trying to do. And I would say, above all else, that was what Carl Jung was trying to do. He believed firmly that the idea of the divine spark within the individual was a, was a metaphysical reality, by which he meant a reality that actually transcended and, and, and existed superordinate to the physical reality, a more real reality. That's whatever consciousness is something we understand from a scientific perspective, not at all. It's been represented in our mythologies as far back as we can push them as an independent agent in the world, giving rise to form. That's how we treat each other, that's how we re recognize ourselves, that's how we judge each other. You make your bed, and then you lie in it. And everyone knows it. And that's not to say that you're not subject to random and chaotic circumstances and the tragedy of life. Just because you can do some things doesn't mean you can do everything. But you can do some things. And if you don't do them, then things fall apart. And the problem with things falling apart is that you will be happy about it to the degree that you're not trying to repair them. Because to the degree that you do not manifest what's within you, then your life falls apart around you. And everything that could make you bitter multiplies until you're in a situation where you want the destruction, you want to bring it on. And it's not surprising. Because life can be so terrible that the question of whether or not it should exist at all can be a real question. But the answer to that is, is life so terrible that it shouldn't exist? Well, the answer is, it depends on how you live it. And if your life is so terrible that you can't bear it, then it raises the question of whether or not you're living it properly. And that's not to say that people don't suffer under burdens that are too great for them to bear. They certainly do. It doesn't matter. Because if you let that embitter you, if you let that destroy your allegiance to the proper path, all it does is make that worse and everything else. It's no out. So, yes. I'm very interested in your comments on this phrase, Western culture is committing suicide. Why is that happening? Guilt. Yes, what guilt? Exactly. <coughs> Who's guilt? What guilt? <laughs> well, there's lots for people to be guilty about. You know, I mean, you might say, to what degree should you bear the horrendous guilt of your ancestors? And, and that's, a, that's a really hard question. I mean, because the, the radical left answer would be, to the degree that you're privileged by your ancestry, you should bear their guilt. And what, commit suicide? Well, well, well yes, the, the question is then what do you do? Well, what you should do is what I suggested today, I would say, is take responsibility for your lives and understand that what you have came at a terrible cost and that you have an ethical obligation to use it properly. And that would be sufficient to pay for the sins of your ancestors, so to speak. I think it's absolutely reprehensible that the radical left dares to attribute to, to ethnically identified groups collective guilt. There's absolutely no excuse for that. It's completely murderous, and that should be rejected out of hand. So, but that's independent of the issue about what you should do, given that part of your wealth is a consequence of historical catastrophe, so you should try to sort that out, roughly speaking, and for everyone's benefit, but not necessarily because you're any more guilty personally. You're guilty as hell personally, but so is everyone else. That's the critical thing. So is everyone else. Okay, I would, I would like to answer that question, but I can't. And the reason, there's two reasons for that. The one is that it's, there's, there's a large element of the answer that has to be legal, and I can't do that. 
And the other part of it is because I'm actually too tired to formulate a coherent response to that. So, and I don't want to formulate an incoherent response. So I'm sorry that I can't be... I mean, obviously, I believe that people's right to communicate should be as untrammeled as possible. But to bridge the gap between that and your specific concern requires a feat of mental energy that I can't do at the moment, and maybe, maybe ever. Ba at the back? Um, hi there. I want to get your view on the social construct of a safe space that universities like my own here at U Ottawa have tried to push on us. Yeah. And as well, I want to understand um, what your view on this whole white privilege thing is that universities like U Ottawa, U of T, yeah. Ryerson, Gale, all these other universities are trying to cram down. Yeah, well, I think the idea of white privilege is absolutely reprehensible. And it's not because white people aren't privileged. I, you know, we have all sorts of privileges. and. Most people have privileges of all sorts, and you should be grateful for your privileges and work to deserve them, I would say. But the, the idea that you can target an ethnic group with a collective crime, regardless of the specific innocence or guilt of the constituent elements of that group, there is absolutely nothing that's more racist than that. It's absolutely abhorrent. I can't... Yeah. I mean, that... that if you, if you really want to know more about that sort of thing, you should read about the kulaks in the, in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, K-U-L-A-K-S, because they were, they were farmers who were very productive. They were the most productive element of the agricultural strata in, in Russia. And they were virtually all killed or raped and robbed by the collectivists who insisted that because they showed signs of wealth, they were criminals and... and, and, and and, and robbers. So, and the, one of the consequences of the prosecution of the Kulaks was the death of six million Ukrainians from a famine in the 1930s. The idea of collectively held guilt at the level of the individual as a legal or philosophical principle is dangerous. It's precisely the sort of danger that people who are really looking for trouble would push. So, and, and just a cursory glance at 20th century history should teach anyone who wants to know exactly how, how unacceptable that is. With regards to your first, okay, there's the safe space issue, but you also said something right at the beginning. You, you, you announced your sexual preference at the beginning, and I understand exactly why you did that, but I, I have a comment about that. And this is something for people in the audience to think about. I've received at least 25 letters from... Um, transsexual people, and that's quite a few because there aren't that many transsexual people, right? So, so they're rare. They're they're very rare, and every single one of them, but one was supportive, and the one that wasn't supportive was mildly critical, and they said exactly the same thing that that you said, rough, roughly speaking, is that. And so, what we one of the things we want to remember is that just because some some noisy activists stand up and say, because I'm a member of this group, or even worse, because I say I'm a member of this group, I am therefore an advocate for that group's interests, is we should just dispense with that, um, with that self-identification as a worthy representative instantaneously, because it's predicated on the idea that one dimension of a person's identity is sufficiently uh, what would you say, broad and all-encompassing, so that you can infer their political stance, for example, which you can't. And so the, the trans people that have written me, they all say the same thing. A, those people do not speak for me. B, we're not all the same. C, most of us think that the enforced pronoun issue is doing nothing but drawing negative attention to us. D, most of us just want to be referred to by the other pronoun. That's the whole point. <laughs> so, you know, so this has been very, very uh, reassuring to me because one of the things I presumed right from the onset was that there was no evidence whatsoever that this nonsensical leg legislation and the postmodern idiocy behind it is in fact demanded by this community or that it will in any way be in anyone's best interest. No. I don't buy it. And I think it's rotten right to the core. So, and then the safe, safe space issue. It's like if you need a safe space, see a therapist. 
Really, really, university, university is not a safe space. If university is done right, it is a radically unsafe space. If you want to go somewhere and get yourself taken apart intellectually, and then hopefully put back together, then you go to university. Everything you believe should be challenged in every possible way, but not in a destructive sense, right? Like when you're renovating a house, you don't just burn it to the ground and walk away. <laughs> That's what the postmodernists do to adolescents, by the way. You dismantle it in consultation with its occupant, attempting to build something more beautiful and functional on the, on the foundation. It's not a safe space, you know, in, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning. I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right, there isn't anything more unsafe than that. And all of them, virtually all of them, write back to me afterwards and say, uh, th this was the most worthwhile class I've ever had in my life, and it changed my life. It's like, well, I'm teaching you the worst possible thing about yourself. And your response is, Oh, that was so useful, and I'm way better than I was. You know, it's, it's, but it's in keeping with the idea that you need to be exposed to things that you fear and hate, because that's where salvation lies. These conceptions, this idea that identity is your choice, is such... Identity isn't your choice when you're three years old on a playground for the first time. Mm. Identity is negotiated with other people, which even the bloody social constructionists admit the idea that it's a whim, that it's something you choose on the basis of your personal, uh, of, of a personal feeling, is it really? It's it's that level of, of understanding is approximately the developmental level of a two-year-old, and and I mean that technically because generally <laughs> two-year-olds aren't capable of of putting themselves in someone else's place, or they're not as capable as they will be. Yeah. And so the idea that you can just impose your identity on me is, that's completely insane. We negotiate our identities with other people all the time. The reason I'm defending freedom of speech, because that's how people with different opinions settle their opinions in a civil society. Peterson, do you have any comments on the Nazi presence at your protest? The presence of Nazis and white supremacists assaulting people at your protest, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I don't like Nazis. I'm speaking out the way I'm speaking out because I think this is a route to no violence. And violence is lurking. And you can say that that sounds like a threat. There was no violence at our protest, though. I just asked, would you refer to me, if it wasn't for this law, and I asked you to refer to me with they, them pronouns, would you? And your answer was no. Not if I was compelled to. But it's, it's better to think through and articulate your own value structure. Mm. And that's partly because one of the reasons that people don't get what they need and want in life is because they don't aim at it. Mm. They, think, they, think, they think they aim at it, but they don't. Well, or, or sometimes they won't even, they won't even, they haven't even taken the time to articulate out their goals, partly sometimes because, well, it's difficult to mm. decide what you want, but I think people are often afraid too that if they do see the problem with making your goals clear is that you also make your conditions for failure more clear mm. that actually turns out to be a good thing mm. but it's scary mm. because if you're vague and 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 unclear about what you're after then you can hide failure from yourself and so people are perfectly willing to keep themselves enveloped in a kind of fog of unknowing mm. because it protects them against the felt sense of failure but it completely eradicates the probability that they'll get what they would need and want in in life hmm. so it's very very counterproductive